All right, top D starts with an easier question. All right, uh, somewhat easier question. Let's have a look. Example 13 of 20, um, 13 out of, yeah, first one out of nine. They are, um, it's from 13 to 21. So example 13, a farmer has sufficient fencing to make a rectangular pen. So keywords, I'll highlight the keywords here, pay attention to the keywords. Rectangular pen, perimeter 200. Okay. What dimensions will give an enclosure of maximum, so enclosure is not important, maximum area. And what dimensions? Okay, all right. The general steps will be, so looking at this, we know the perimeter. Let's write down what we know. So rectangular pen. Uh, and then perimeter is 200, okay? What dimension, so we don't know, so let's, let's put that X and Y. We give an enclosure of maximum area. So we need max area. And then what's X and Y, what dimensions? Okay, all right. So let's see, perimeter is 200. What can we do with this information? Well, perimeter is X plus X plus Y plus Y, all right? Or 2X plus 2Y is equals to the perimeter, which is 200. Okay, so I divide everything by 2, x plus y must be 100. And then we want the area. Well, what's the area? So area is x times y, right? It's just x times y. But remember, when you see three variables, 1, 2, and 3, you don't want three variables. You only want two. So to get two variables, similar to a question that I explained last week, you make, let's say, y the subject here. So y is 100 minus x. Okay, and then we substitute this into the other y. Right, so you get a equals to x times 100 minus x. Right, so far so good. Yeah, then we want maximum area. So remember when you hear maximum or highest or lowest, whatever, maximum minimum, that links to the derivative. All right, so this is when derivative is equals to zero. Okay, at the maximum point, because that's the turning point. Right, so uh, most of the time, unless it's like the absolute maximum and minimum, then you've got to find the turning point and then the start and end point, like what we did last week. So then you got to, in order to derive it, you need to expand that first, so 100x minus x squared, and then you derive it. So you can write fancy dA over dx, so the derivative of A with respect to x would be 100 minus 2x. Okay? Yeah? And then, uh, then you set that equals to zero to solve for x. So bring the 2x onto the left-hand side equals to 100, so x would be 50. So how? How do we know that this is this dimension of x will give the maximum area? How do, how do we know? How do we know that um, the area will be maximum at the turning point? So how? How do we know? Because there be, is a half of 100? No. Not quite. Something else. I got to think about this question. How do we know that it is going to be a maximum area? Hint, look at the area function. What kind of function is this? Quadratic. What kind of quadratic? Um. It is quadratic. That's the first hint. Concave down. Yes, quadratic, concave down. So the turning point is? The top. Yes, that's right. So, uh, since, right, so since um, area is, since the area function is a, uh, you can write an upside down, you can write whatever you want here as long as you indicate that, you know this is an upside down quadratic, upside down parabola, or a concave down quadratic, either way, right, the turning point is the maximum. Okay, it's not just local maximum, it's the absolute maximum because it will just keep going down, it doesn't go up again. Okay, so you need to make uh, need to make a statement because remember, turning point could be maximum or minimum, right? Local max or local min. You need to make sure you, you state how, why, how do you know it's a local maximum. So yeah, so x equals to 50, which means you got y equals to 100 minus 50, 100 minus x, which is 50, right? And then maximum area would be 50 times 50, which is 2,500. Then you make the final conclusion, all right? Max area equals 2,500 when <clears throat> x equals 50 and y equals 50. What kind of rectangular pen is this? 
what kind of rectangular plane has 50 meters and 50 meters? Uh, is it in meters? Yeah. It's a square. It's a square, yes. So in fact, this result actually shows something interesting. If you have a string, if you want to make like any kind of like square-ish or rectangle-ish thing, and you want the maximum area, the maximum area is always a square. Because when you think about it, if you stretch it into like a longer, longer thing, like the, the area looks smaller, as opposed to when you, you know, make it into a square, right? So yeah, like, like that, that's a, that's a small area. And then when you make it a square, it's a, it's a bigger area. Okay, so given the certain perimeter, the square is actually the shape with the biggest area. Right? Interesting result here. So yeah, so that's uh, example 13. Next is example 14. Two variables x and y, this is very similar to what we did last week. Uh, the, uh, question 6 last week, remember on the course I have, question 6, yeah. the one with three variables, did you do the questions? Uh, I did cover them on Wednesday after this one. Yeah. Okay, good, alright. Two variables x and y are such that x to the power of 4 times y equals 8. A third variable z is defined by this thing here. Find the values of x that and z that give uh, x and y that give z a stationary value. Use the second derivative test to show that this value of z is a minimum. So same thing, first we've got to make y in terms of x. So normally I prefer x, that's why I make y in terms of x. Right? And then I substitute this one into the z equation here. So I get z equals to x plus 8. Now I'll write it as 8x power minus 4 because I know I need to derive it. Okay? Because you know, we need to find a stationary value of z and then prove that it is a minimum by the second derivative. So I now go dz over dx, that would be 1 minus 32x power negative 5. Okay, good so far? Yeah. If you notice, this one is going to be a bit tricky to solve equals to 0. Right, let's see if you guys can see the pattern here. What do we do next? You convert it back into a fraction. Yes, you do convert it back to a fraction. So 1 minus 32 over x power 5. What's next? Anyone? Um, combine it, I think. No, you don't combine it. Something else. You swap the 0 and the 32 um, over x plus 5? No. Wait, you mean you swap the 0 with the 32 over x plus 5? Yes, so it becomes 32 uh, over x power 5 equals 1. Yeah, correct, correct, yes. 32 over x power 5 equals 1 is the correct idea. What's next? Times x power 5. Yep, times x power 5. Then that would be that, and so what's x? Uh, 2. 2 equals x. Okay, because uh, because 2 power 5. Now, you can either solve it that way, or you can make it into 2 power 5 equals x power 5, and therefore 2 equals x. Because right? 32 is just 2 power 5. So yeah, so you got 2 equals to x, and all right. Now we need to use the second derivative test to show that this value of z is a minimum. Tell me... Anyone tell me, can anyone tell me, what would the second derivative be for that value to be a minimum? A positive value. Yes, it will be a positive value. Why? Emily, why would a positive second derivative give you a minimum? And what second derivative links to? Concavity. Concavity. Very good. Positive value means? D is concave down. Positive is concave up. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Concave up. And concave up means minimum. Right? So that's what you need to imagine in your head that like think of. It's going to have to be a um, positive value. Let's see. So, okay, look at this one here. We go d squared z over dx squared. I just don't remember that. Or z double dash, whichever is the case. So that would be 1 is gone, and then uh, times the negative 5 down to negative 32 would be 160, x to the power of negative 6. All right? Okay? And change that up into 160 over x power 6. At the x value of 2 that we found, then the second derivative or z double dash would be 160 over 2 power 6, and this is more than 0. You do not need to calculate what the value is. Okay? Because if you leave it this way, right, 2 power 6, then you can write since, say that's more than 0, since the z double dash at x equals 2 is more than 0, uh, this value. Uh, so the you can write the z at x equals two is a local minimum. That makes sense. Yeah, that's how you use the second derivative. 
and then they ask like um, to show that this value of z. Okay, we need to probably find the z value. I think let me let me check. I don't think they mentioned that. Yeah, nah, they don't mention that. Oh no no, no. Yeah, you do you do have to mention you do to get the z value. So after you got a, uh, the x value, uh, then z would be equals to what's the formula? Uh, x plus eight over x power four. So it'd be two plus eight over two power four, and that would be two plus. Uh, 8 over 16 is 1 over 2 so then z would be 2.5 okay so since that, that, that the z equals to you can write here the z equals to 2.5 and x equals to 2 is a local minimum so that's a more um, accurate final answer okay yeah so now you have to change up your answer it happens all right example uh, any question here no, all good. Yeah, moving on. Example fifteen. Two out of nine. Example fifteen: a cylindrical tin canister. Let's see. Um, a cylindrical tin canister at uh, closed at both ends ha has a surface area of one hundred. Find correct to two decimal places the greatest volume it can have. If the radius can be at most two, find the greatest volume it can have. So let's see, cylindrical, right? Close at both ends, and then surface area 100. We need two decimal places, which means the intermediate values will be how many decimal places? More than two. More than two. Four decimal places. Yeah, two more. Normally I go two more. Okay. So this one means that the intermediate, so intermediate values must be four dp, just to make sure the final answer is going to be correct to two decimal places. Greatest volume, aka derived volume somehow, right? And then radius can be at most two, aha. Uh -huh. So that one means the radius must be less than or equals to two centimeters, right? That's going to be uh, restricting the volume later. And then you gotta find the greatest volume it can have. All right, let's see. Surface area, so for this question is going to be difficult if you guys don't know what a cylindrical tin is and you don't know how to calculate the surface area and volume. Okay, so what's a cylindrical tin? Give me an example of a cylindrical tin. A can, a can. A can yes, a can. Okay, I just need to make sure that you guys actually know what it is before I show you guys the shape here. Okay, so how do we calculate the surface area? So we're talking about surface area and volume, right? Surface area and volume. What do we need to know in order to calculate the surface area? Actually, the volume is easier. What do we need to know in order to calculate the volume? The length, width, and the height. The height, yes. What do you mean by length? Oh, not for not in this case. Um, what do we need then? The diameter. The diameter, or actually radius, because remember they said the radius is at most two, so we use the same the same variable right, as what they say. Normally, you need the radius, not the diameter. Okay. So okay. So radius and height. Now, how do we calculate volume? Of this of this canister. The equation for a Yep, what's the equation? <laughs> pi r squared times h. Yes, it is a pi r squared. Now this is how you remember. It is a surface area times by the height. Does that make sense? It's not a thing where you take the surface area, then you extrude it, you make the volume. Right? Surface area, extrude to make volume. So the surface area times height. How do you get surface area of a circle? Is pi r squared times by the h. Okay? Once again, three variables. We don't like that. We want, well, pi is just pi, but we don't like h. So we need to get h in terms of r somehow. And we know the surface area, right? 100 centimeters squared. Now that means we need the formula for surface area, right? What's the, what's the formula for surface area? Okay, so now using surface area. What's the, formula, what's the formula for surface area? Just visually, what can you, what can you see? So all the faces. Two circles and, two circle and? and rectangle like rectangle. Yes, it's two times the circle area, circle area, and then plus the rectangle. What's the rectangle? Um, H times the circumference. Yes, it's h times circumference. Does it make sense, everyone? 
Yeah? Because when you open up the cylinder, let's say if I open a little bit, it looks like that, right? Right? And then uh, it looks like that, and then you get like the circumference. Does that make sense? You know, when you fully unwrap it, it becomes the, uh, a rectangle. But when you wrap it over, the, the, the length of the, um, of the rectangle is the circumference of the circle. Okay, so yeah, so h times circumference. What's the circumference formula? 2 pi r. 2 pi r, yes. So that'll be h times 2 pi r. Mm -hmm. And the circle areas, well, we got that earlier. 2 pi r squared plus that, right? So 2 pi r squared plus that equals 100. Okay, and then we can finally try to uh, get h in terms of r. Move the 2 pi r squared over, minus, equals h times 2 pi r. Okay, sorry, one second. Right, okay, so we were at uh, using the surface area to make h in terms of r, right? Because remember, what we're trying to do is we use the volume. Because remember, they said the greatest volume, so we have to derive this thing here. We have to derive it. Right, and then set it equals to zero and do all that jazz. But in order to derive it, you will need to make h in terms of r. So get rid of the, the random h variable there. Okay, and that's what we're trying to do here. So all right, so do a bit of our, um, our manipulation. Divide both sides by two hr. Okay, oh, this one. All right. Now then we sub this thing. All right. So this one sub into the main formula which is v equals pi r squared h okay so sub into that then we would get uh, v equals to pi r squared times by whatever that is i'm just copying it what's next combine with pi r squared simplify Simplify is what I'm looking for. Combine, where here combine, normally it's like expanding and you know, multiplying in. But in this case, the correct word to use is simplify. So r, pi and pi, r squared and r, right? Simplifying that, the pi is gone. r squared over r would be r. And then this one will still be over 2, right? Times by the, whatever the brackets is here. Okay, make sense? All right, what's next? Remember, we need to find the greatest volume and then um, note that uh, at this point, just keep in mind that the maximum radius is two centimeters, right? So it must be less than or equal to two. Okay, but yeah, how do we find the maximum volume? You have to anti-derive. I mean, uh, derive, sorry. Yes, be careful with the wording. You do derive it. Okay, so uh, I go V dash equals to what? Um, if you expand it first. Yes, you expand it first. See, you're like, wait, hang on. You can't actually derive this. You have to expand it first. So V would be, well, when you times in, 100 over 2 would be 50 R minus 2 over 2 will cancel out. So that will be pi R cubed. All right? Yeah? And then V dash would be, now it's easy, right? 50 minus 3 pi R squared. Just simple derivative. All right? Then set that equals to zero equals uh, is zero equals to fifty minus three pi r squared. Bring the three pi r squared over equals to fifty. Uh, then r squared would be fifty over three pi, and so r would be uh, positive square root fifty over three pi. Is that right? Am I missing anything? Uh, plus minus. Plus minus. Okay. Plus minus, and then. What's next? Um, okay, let's say you want to calculate. Oh. Alright, punch it into the calculator, which I can't remember where I left it. Well, let's see if it's equal to, equal to 2 or less than 2. Yes, very good. See if it's equal to or less than 2. Very good. So I'll calculate that first. So square root of um, 50 divided by 3 pi. Okay. So that would be r equals to plus minus 2.3033. Remember, four there's more places. So what? What now? It's bigger than the limit. Okay, it's bigger than the limit. Now, note that r equals to positive or negative. All right, so then you would write r equals to um, 2.3033 or r equals to negative 2.3033. 
Uh huh. And then what's next? So we use the negative. Sorry. Use the negative um, radius. Use the negative radius. Wait, you can't. Have, you can't have a negative right. radius. So you reject the negative radius. Now, note that I, I told you guys i is less than equals to that, right? However, the implicit domain, implicit domain is r must be more than zero. So actually, the actual domain is zero less than r less than equals to two. Yeah, okay. So actually, it's uh, between zero and two. I still write the implicit version, but you should know radius can't be less than zero, right? So yeah, uh, find correct to the to two decimal places the greatest volume it can have. So note that this one here, they ask two questions. One is what's the greatest possible volume? And then question two is, if R is less than equals two, what is the greatest volume then? Okay, so then the first part is the greatest possible volume, greatest uh, V would be the V at R equals to 2.3033. Right? That would be the greatest possible volume. Okay. But how do, how do I know for sure that this is the greatest one? How do I know this is not the uh, minimum? Well, actually, there's only one of them. So you, you, it's safe to assume that it's going to be the maximum volume. Is it safe? Do you think it's safe to assume that this is going to be a maximum volume? Probably not. Probably not. Yeah, and you'll be right. You need to check. Okay. So check using v dash, uh, double dash. So v double dash would be 50, oh sorry, derive that, that would be negative six pi r. Okay, now, v double dash at 2.3033 would be negative six pi times 2.3033. Is this more, less than zero or equals to zero? Uh, less than. Less than zero because this is a negative number. Right, less than zero, therefore it is a local uh, maximum. maximum, yes. Less than zero, which is concave down, right? Concave down at this point, which means it is a local maximum. So yes, this will be the maximum volume. And then you can conclude greatest volume is the volume at that X, sorry, that R value. And then substituting in, just punch that in, into that formula there. Right, so that will be, um, actually we'll use this one here, the simplified one, or maybe even this one here. Uh, since this one is a calculator question, we just punch it in. So 50, 50 times 2.3033 minus uh, 3 pi r squared, so 3 pi times 2.3033, everything squared. Okay, and then punch that in, the answer should be, um, let's see, so but in 76. Point 7, 8 and the unit is centimeters, cubic centimeters okay, so this is the greatest possible volume but next part is if the uh, radius is less than or equal to 2 right, then greatest, greatest volume equals to V at R equals 2 Right? You, can't, you can't use 2.3033 anymore because you know, it's more than the, the maximum. So the maximum is simply at the end point. Does it make sense? Yeah, because the volume, it looks something like that, right? And if the local maximum is at 2.3033, then at the point before that, let's say 2, if you cap it off here, you can't have this section, then the point before that, which is 2, will be where uh, the volume is maximum, right? That will be the max volume. Okay? Make sense out? Yeah. Okay, so then you sub that in, that will be 50 times 2 minus 3 pi times 2 cube. Is it square or cube? Cube, yeah. Power 3. Yeah, sub that in, and then you get the volume to be um, 74.87 cubic centimeters. Okay. Right. Um, any, any question? Wait. Let me check something. Oh, pi r cube. So it will be pi r cube. There's no three here. Pi r cube. Pi fifty r minus pi r cube. Yeah. Okay. Any question? So.
Oh, good. Emily, is that bad? All right. What's your confidence right now? All right. Let's say, uh, uh, assume that two weeks later, you look at this question in the exam. What's the, what's the probability that you can get this one right? Saham, what do you think? You see a question like that in the exam. Like we just based on like straight now. Well, uh, say you project yourself right now from now to the exam without doing any more revision. Oh, okay, okay. Maybe let's say you do whatever revision that you plan out to do. Imagine your ideal self, right? You do all the re revisions that you can that you can that you need to do in order to prepare for the exam, and then you see something like this in the exam. What's the con What's the your confidence that you can do and get perfect score on this, or maybe close to perfect score on this? Ten means I would get a perfect score. Nine means there's a you, know, you would probably lose a bit of marks here and there. What's your confidence? Six seven. Six seven. Okay, all right, Emily? No. Five? Five? Six, seven. Six, seven? Okay, so basically, you guys feel that this question is still quite a challenging one to do, right? Not, definitely not something straightforward to, you know, to, be figure, to figure out in the exam. This, this question, there, are, there is a similar one. It's similar to question six in the... Um, yeah, similar to question six in the, in the set of exercises. Is this complex familiar? It's complex familiar, yes. Everything in this chapter, almost everything is complex familiar and above. Okay, so if you want to practice for chapter twelve, just do these ones. Okay, this is the only chapter. Chapter twelve is the only chapter that I recommend do everything. All right, if you're lazy to redo the other chapters, just do everything in chapter twelve, and that would cover almost everything in the previous chapters. Okay, it covers sec first derivative, second derivative. Absolute maximum, absolute minimum, stationary point, types of stationary points, which is everything. Okay, so 12B, 17 questions. I will go through only the examples. So you guys gotta go back and try the questions yourself. All right, next example. I'm pausing here, giving guys a, a brain break because it's going to get harder. All right, let's, uh, let's have a look at the next one. Example 16. Now, this example, keep in mind the question that, I'm ask, uh, that I'll ask again, which is that if you see this, after all my explanations, if you see this in the exam, given all preparation, what's the confidence that, that what's the confidence level that you can do this? Remember the, your answer for the previous one, about six, seven, five, six, seven for the previous one. Have a look. Very short question. A TV cable company has 1,000 subscribers who are paying $5 per month. It can get 100 more subscribers for each 10 cent decrease in the monthly fee. What monthly fee will yield the maximum revenue and what will this revenue be? Where do we even start? You read this? And the first, first time I read this, my first reaction is most students will have no idea where to start with this one. Now, do you guys have an idea on where to start with this one? Surely it's a derivative question. This is in chapter 12 day. So surely you have to form an equation and derive it and set equals to zero because you see the maximum revenue, right? And then what monthly fee? So how do we even get started? How do we even form an equation for this thing? No idea? Then you're part of the 99 students who most likely will have no idea when you see this kind of question. The, I'll tell you the technique in advance. The technique is you, uh, you need to, um, it's, it's about pattern recognition, okay? Pattern recognition. So keep this idea in mind. There will be a pattern and you have to be able to recognize it and using this to form equation. Uh, form equation. Now, before I, before I start on this, this is an advanced technique. Okay, this is like a complex, unfamiliar type technique that I'm showing you guys here. Because this technique is the thing that will, one of the techniques that will help you figure out an un complex, unfamiliar question. When you read and you have no idea where to start. Okay, it's one of those techniques. All right, so first let's see. So let's try to figure out a pattern here. Um, 1,000 subscribers and $5 a month. Okay, so monthly fee, what monthly fee will yield the maximum revenue? And then 100 more subscribers for each 10 cent decrease in the monthly fee. 
So to start off, you always need to declare some variables, right? Let R be revenue. Okay, and then let X be monthly fee. How do I decide on these two variables? Well, because the final question asked me about monthly fee and the maximum revenue, all right? So that gives you a hint on what kind of equation. That means that you gotta find R into, as a function of X. Does it make sense? Okay, so R equals to some sort of function of X, and then you gotta go DR over DX, R dash, R dash equals zero, find X, and then sub it in to get the revenue. Okay, so once you've got, this is how you get started to actually slowly form your own equation. You need to define some variables first. Normally there'll be like a Y and an X. In this case, it's R and X. Or you can, you can use um, F for fee, or, you know, C or fee, whatever. I'll just use X because you're normally used to X. Okay, so R as a function of X. Now, let's think about it for a second. Normally, um, revenue would be the monthly fee, which is X times by the number of subscribers, right? Num of subscribers. So I'll show you guys the brainstorming technique that I'm going through. If I see number of subscribers as like a word in there, that means you need to define it as a variable. Let n be the number of subscribers. Number of subscribers. Okay? Then I can change it into x times n. Make sense so far? What's the next idea? You should have formed that thought in your mind before I finish writing it. Because it's similar to the previous question. Remember, we've got one, two, three variables. Like You don't want three variables, you want two, right? So get n in terms of x. Okay, so that's the next idea. How do we get n in terms of x now? All right, this is, uh, and now that leads to the pattern recognition that um, I was saying earlier. In order to figure it out, you need to actually see the relationship between x and n. Okay, so what, what do we know so far? Okay, so X, remember, uh, X is at the moment 1,000, right? Oh, sorry, um, N is 1,000, okay? And then X is the number of subscribe. Uh, uh, sorry, X is the monthly fee, which is five, all right? The next part is important. So, so make sure you watch the, the next part. The next one is very important. You won't be able to get this from just seeing, sorry, from, from just listening. Every... 10 cent decrease in the monthly fee, remember the five is in dollars. So when you get five and you decrease it by 10 cents or zero minus 0 0.1, the subscribers increase by 100. Note that I'm not plusing it in and I'm not actually subtracting it. I'm writing it as a expression, right? Does this make sense? So I'm, I'm interpreting the get 100 more subscribers for each 10 cent decrease. Now, in order to see a pattern, you need to have a few examples, okay? Let's have a few more examples. So let's just say we decrease it by one more time. So minus 0 0.1 minus another 0 0.1. Then you will increase this by two times, right? Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. So now do you see the pattern here? The N would be, so remember we'll put N here means N equals 1000 when X equals five. And then N equals this when X equals that, right? So that's what it means. So do you see that uh, when you increase it by like um, a certain a certain pattern, so one thousand, oh sorry, when you decrease the price five minus zero point one times by a value uh, times by a number m. Okay, we don't even know what a number is, but we minus it a certain number of times. Uh, let's say t for the number of times. Okay, number of times we decrease the price by ten cents then the subscribers will be plus 100 times by that same number of times. Does it make sense? Yeah? Yeah? Okay? And remember, we made the table like that so that we can write n equals to this when x equals to that. It's a simultaneous equation in order to make n in terms of x. Remember, we want n in terms of x? Okay? And now we've got two equations. n equals to... 1000 plus 100 times by whatever t is okay? and t is the number of times you decrease the the the, the price and x the, the the cost would be 5 minus 0 0.1 times by t okay we want n in terms of x which means we need to make 
t in terms of x and sub it into the n equation here. So far so good? No, the part you just said this doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense. <laughs> Ta, you still okay? You still following? Or are you like, I'm pausing here because this is the critical part. Does it make sense up to this point here, that line there? Does, does that make sense? Emily, yeah? So the man so good? So how? Sure? Yeah. Yeah? So up to that point, okay. Put it this way, let me rub out the new one I just, I just uh, wrote, right? And now I want to rearrange this equation. Okay? I'll, you see the reason for a moment, but I'll rearrange it. So I put 0.1t on this side and I move the x over. So that would go to 5 minus x. Make sense so far? Yeah? Okay? And 0 0.1 is 1 over 10, right? So t over 10 equals to 5 minus x, yeah? And then I would write t equals to 50 minus 10x, yeah? So far so good? Why do you think I write, why do you think I rearrange it this way? Remember, what are we trying to do? Keep our goal in mind. This is our goal. How can we get n in terms of x now? Because there'll be some t into the n equation we have there. That's right. This t, you see? This t connects to that t there. Right? That's how these two variables, you know, the number of uh, subscribers and x are related. Okay? That's how they're related. So once you've got, that's why I made t the subject. That's what I said earlier, right? Make t the subject and then sub it in. So then I got n equals to 1000 plus 100 and then t would be 50 minus 10x. Like so. Now then, this n connects with that n. Okay? You see, it's like a, it's a bit of like a, um, a rabbit hole where you need to like jump down first and then slowly crawl your way back up to get back to the original equation. Then you get revenue is x times by 1000 plus 100 times by 50 minus 10x. Like so. We slowly expand that, r equals to, I'll keep the x here, 1000, expand the first bracket, plus 500, minus 1000x, oh sorry, minus five, plus 5000, minus 1000x. So revenue would be x times by 6000, minus 100x, and so revenue would be 6000x minus 100x squared. Okay? Oh, sorry, it should be 1,000 times by 100 is 1,000. Okay. Does it make sense so far? Does it make sense so far? Yeah, just rearranging. All right. See that equation there? Okay, so uh, to simplify a few things, I'm just going to write, I take out 1,000 as a common factor, and then inside the brackets, which is be 6x minus x squared. Okay. See that formula? Now look at the textbook. They literally get that formula in like one, right? In like one, two, three, four, li uh, three lines. Literally three lines. Can you get that in three lines? Can you get the? Can you get this very first line right? So, oh, the number of subscriber is one thousand plus one hundred times magic numbers, right? Like, there's no way in the exam. Like, how do you? How do you even get this? I can interpret this for you guys, right? It's like, oh. 1,000 and then for every change in subscribers, you know, like 5 minus the total, like the cost will over, no. It's too hard to explain, okay? So the textbook actually just gave the answer. They just literally gave up on explaining. It's like, oh, obviously it's this. There's no way anyone's going to be able to get that in the exam without working through it, right? There's no way. I looked at, initially I looked at it, I'm like, how do they get that? And so I just scrapped the explanations and then I made my own explanations. And that's when I realized, oh yeah, that's how they got it. But there's no way you can get that from the like, straight away from the start. You have to go through now backtracking because once you get to this point, you derive it, set equals to zero, find x, sub it in, find revenue. Easy, right? So once you've got the equation, after this, it's, it's easy. I'm not going to go through the rest of the question. But the important thing for you guys to remember here is this technique here where um, if you if you have an example, we started off, okay, I'll go I'll backtrack into this one here. We started off with the first example here, okay, where number of subscribers and X, and then we find a pattern. Remember, the, the trick to find a pattern is to not add the numbers together. It's very hard because the patterns are normally linked by something else, right? So uh, it, it's to actually write it out in terms of expressions. You don't need the final answer. You need the pattern, right? 
you need to find the pattern. You need to find the relationship between the number of subscribers and the cost, right? Because remember, we got to this point and we are like, oh, we need N in terms of X. So we need the number of subscribers as a function of the, whatever the cost is in order to sub it in and replace N, right? And that's why we need the pattern. Right? I'm repeating this so you guys remember to find patterns, you need to express the expression, you need to write out the expressions and then um, you find, you need to define a common variable, see a common variable between them, right? In this case, the number of times we decrease the cost is the same as the number of times you increase the subscribers. And that is the shared variable. And you use that shared variable in order to create a substitution to make uh, n in terms of x over here. Make sense? Yeah? So how? Are you sure you're following? Yeah. <laughs> the answer is not on my face. The answer is in the whiteboard. <laughs> it's on the screen. Yeah? So when I'm explaining, I normally would highlight a lot of stuff. So make sure you pay attention to that. So, Suleiman, any question? No. No? Okay. So far, so good. So yeah, what monthly fee would you have maximum revenue and what would this revenue be? The rest of it is just, when you get up to this point, it's just, um, all right. It's just find r dash, right? Equals to zero, find x, and then sub x into r to find the max revenue. Okay, so once you've got up to this point, the rest of the question is easy. Okay, assuming you can do the, the, the other part, it's just the, this, uh, deriving the equations, right? It's not too difficult. Assuming you can do those parts, what are the chances? With all kinds of revision, you can do this question in the exam. What, what's your confidence that you can do something like this in the exam? Given that you get all your revision done correctly. So this question. This specific one. If you see something exactly like this, numbers changed. What's the chances that you can do this? Okay. Hmm? Eight. Eight times? Okay, good. Confident, Suleiman? Oh, like the, the deriving part of it's easy, but like the... It's called like understanding like mm -hmm. the first... Like making a formula, because with, the, with this there wasn't any equation, so you yep. Uh, take what they're giving you and make an equation. That's probably like what, what I wouldn't be able to do. Mm -hmm. like six on that, the rest like a nine. Okay, all right. Emily? Um, it stays the same. It's five. Same? Okay. Five? Okay. So, yeah, that, mean, that means that, Suleiman, you need to go back and try to try this question. As long as you get to the equation, now revision strategy. Okay, next is revision strategy. You guys won't have time to do every single question in the textbook and you don't have to. The key is you do the questions that will help you learn the most. So anytime you give your, you, you, uh, you state the answer that, oh, I am, you know, like 50% uh, confident, only 50% confident. That means if you do the question again, it will raise your confidence, right? If you do the question again, it will help you learn something. So, so how, if you're saying you're 80% confident, then you may only need to do up to say this point here. When you get the equation, you're like, oh yeah, I can do the rest, skip the rest, okay? But sometimes it's still good to go through all the way to the end, but you don't need to go through to the end all the time. You get to the point where you're like, oh, I know how to do the rest, skip it, find something else to do, okay? One week before the exam though, the last week before the exam, so after our last lesson before the exam, after that point, don't do new questions, okay? The week before the exam, you need to go back and do everything that you think you're confident with and make sure you make zero mistakes. Okay? That's the trick. One week for the exam, you need to boost your confidence. There's no point in learning new things. I don't, it's very difficult to learn new things. It's more of like making sure you don't make any mistakes. Okay? Any new thing you learned in the last week, put it this way. You have like three months to learn new things right, for the exam. And we've spent like, say, two months and uh, two and a half months. right? Because you have two more, two more lessons after this. All right? We've spent two and a half months Actually, I think we've got six months for Unit 4. We spent, say, five and a half months learning new content for Unit 4, like many, many, many chapters, right? Five and a half months learning Unit 4 content. The last two weeks, or let's just say uh, five months and three weeks, so you have one week left before the exam. What are the chances that something you learn in that, in that last one week, something new, completely new, will come out on the exam? It's very, very small. More probability, right? If you have six, you know, like let's say... Um, Six months would be 20, let's say 20 weeks, right? 
What's the chance is that in the last one week, you learn something, one out of 10 weeks, you learn something that's going to come in the exam. It's very, very low. So that's why the last one week, I find it's more important for you guys to actually do the questions that you think might be on the exam rather than something that's challenging. You're not going to gain much from it. So you do something that you think might be on the exam, right? So the last week is, for, is a chance for you to um, reinforce the knowledge that you are, uh, that you, know, you think you might be lacking of, of course. So reinforcing the knowledge means doing something that you have done before, but you feel a bit like, oh, I'm not sure if I'm 100% confident, then do those ones, right? But doing new questions in the last one week may or may not help that much, all right? So redoing questions, making sure all your working is good and retracing your steps, learn, make sure that you understand all the techniques is normally more important, all right? In saying that, if someone, let's say your friends or your teacher be like, oh, try this question, do it. Right? Like you yourself don't need to go out to find new questions, but if someone throw a question at you, you know, take a challenge and do it. Just don't spend too much time on it. Okay? Remember, from now to, the, to about one week before the exam, you need to do the challenging questions to learn as much as you can. And then the moment, one week before the exam, just revise. Right? Just revise the, the ones that are more, are more likely to be on the exam, including simple familiar. Okay? I do not want a situation where you come back and be like, oh, I lost five marks in the simple familiar question. That is stupid. That's not worth it. Okay? So let me tell you this thing, right? The, remember this, uh, I, I told you there was one uh, grade 12 who got 14 out of 15 this year in the unit 3 exam. I, I asked him a question. I asked him, oh, what did you do the last one week? He was like, oh, I just, I just did the, 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 the question, like simple familiar, complex familiar. And I was like, oh, did you do complex familiar? I was like, he was like, um, no, I, I did a bunch of that and you know, I, I just hope for the best. And I was like, mm, he did the right strategy. That was the right strategy. So that when the exam came out, he knew exactly what to do for the strong one, for the for the, most of them and got the marks for most of them. Right? And he was lucky that he, he could actually get some marks for the complex unfamiliar question. And that's how he bumped to 14 out of 15. But you need to get a solid 12 out of 15 first, which is 80%. To get a solid 12 out of 15, you need to, one week before the exam, you need to revise every single thing from every single topic. But in order to do that, you need to do easier questions. You can't afford to spend half an hour on one question now. Can't afford to do that uh, one week before the exam. Okay, so so that's why in saying that, right now is the only time for you to spend on the harder questions like these things here, for you to learn new things. Okay, so make sure you do these questions, otherwise you're not going to learn enough for the exam. Okay, remember you don't have that much time before the exam. Okay, all right. Now moving on to um, example seventeen. Okay. Now, this is one of those things, this is one of those questions where uh, it's also a pattern recognition thing and you need to form your own equation again. Let's see, let's see how hard or how easy this is. A manufacturer annually produces and sells one, uh, 10,000 shirts. Okay, 10,000 shirts annually. Sales are uniformly distributed throughout the year. Uh, okay, may not fully understand what that is. Skip that for now. The production cost of each shirt, okay, so cost of each shirt is 23. And the carrying cost, uh, what's that? Carrying cost is storage, insurance, and interest. Okay, all right, whatever that is. Depend on the total number of shirts in a production run. That's a lot happening. Okay, let's read that again. The carrying cost depend on the total number of shirts in a production run. So we've got a new, a new term here. Production run. Mm, okay. Oh, they define it. A production run is the number x, oh, they give you a variable, better use that, okay? Give you a variable x, better use that in your equation. A production run is the number x of shirts, the number of shirts, okay, which are under production at a given time. All right, all right. So x is the number of shirts that are under production, all right? The number of shirts that are under production, that's what it means by a production run. And then the setup costs for a production run are 40. Okay, the annual carrying cost uh, x to the power 3 over 2. Oh my god, what is this? This is linked to the number of shirts for a production run. How do you even link this? Oh, let's see. Find the size of a production run that minimizes ah, derivative. Uh, minimizes means derivative. Set equals to 0, yada, yada. But in order to do that, you need an equation. Minimizes the total or uh, total setup and carrying cost for a year. Okay, so... 
Based on the last question, we need we know what the first step is. What's the first step? Anyone? Define variables. Very good. Define variables. Let something be something. Okay, let what be what? Uh, X, the number of shirts. Yep, yep. Number of shirts, what? Under production. Yep, yep. Under production or number of shirts uh, in a production run. I, I'm using that term because the, the term production run is used again and again. Number of shirts in a production run. Okay, all right. What else? What else can we define? Remember, you need to derive some sort of equation and there will be a, uh, like a y variable and an x variable. So we've got x, now what's a y variable? It could be like the setup cost. Sorry? The setup cost. Not just that? Carrying costs. Not just that? And the number of shirts sold. The total cost. Yeah? Okay. So let's see B D total cost for a year. Right? For a year. So now so far what do we know? So C is the total cost and so C equals to setup total setup plus carrying. Okay, and uh, what is the uh, carrying cost for a year? X to the power of 3 over 2. That's right, X to the power of 3 over 2. Okay, we're slowly getting somewhere. So this is annual setup cost. Remember, this is uh, for a year, yeah? So that'll be setup cost for a year. Plus X to the power 3 over 2. How do we get the total setup cost for a year? Give you a hint. Look at uh, everything that we have not uh, have not worked through yet. Okay, so so far, okay, we have um, annual carrying cost. I'll rub it out because you know we have used that already. Uh, size of production run minimizes total setup cost. We know it's going to be c equals to a function of x, and then we derive that yada yada find x. Okay, and what else have we not used? Oh, we have defined X already, so let's drop that out. And the carrying cost depends on the total number of shirts in the production run. Well, that was the uh, the carrying cost here, so we can drop that out. Drop that out depend on oh, sorry. Depend on um, let me just get this one out again. Okay. Yep, uh, depend on, so I can drop this one out here. Okay, what else? What else have we not used? And how do we use uh, the other information? Use the $40 for production run. Okay, okay, how do we use it? Um, multiply by 10,000 to get, because isn't one production run 10,000? No. 10,000 shirts is what they produce annually. So is, that one production the production run for forty dollars is that for? It's a setup cost for a production for one production run. But mm. remember, how so? How, how frequent are the production runs? So. Yes, how frequent are the production? How do we find how frequent? Because okay, okay, that's the good hint. Now set up right. So this one to expand it is the annual, right? Annual um. Yeah, annual setup cost, right? Uh, for a production run, so annual production run cost essentially, right? Um, let's see. Yeah, so annual oh, yeah, 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 okay. Uh, setup cost, production cost is 20. Right, let me see. We don't even use the. You don't even use everything. Okay, that's all right. Okay, so the annual um, setup cost, all right, annual setup cost, okay, would be what forty times by how many runs are there? Right, 40 times by number of production runs. 
Okay, how do we find out the number of production run per year? Remember, C is in terms of X, right? We want we want C as a function of X. So far, we've got X X power three over two, not bad, right? But how do we get the setup? Will be forty times something, right? Because the uh, each production run is forty bucks, right? And you gotta times it by how many runs are there in a year? How do you find out how many production runs are there? We use the number of um, search pro search produced and sold to ten thousand. Yeah. Like yeah. Yeah, use that number and how? Um, yeah, they have to produce 10,000 shirts a year. And I'll give you a hint. How many production, uh, production runs are there? It will be something that has X in it. Is it? Uh, 40 times 10,000 X? No. 10,000 is the total shirts they produce. In each run, there are X shirts being produced. So How many? 23. Sorry? 23. 23 is the cost of each shirt. No, no, not five. So, how do we get a number of runs? Ten thousand per year. X per run. So how many run per year? Okay, put it simple. Ten thousand shirts a year. Let's say you produce ten shirts per run. How many runs a year? Uh, yeah. How did you get that? Yeah, so if it's X number of shirts per run, yes, it is 10,000 over X. Does it make sense? Yeah, if you see it, it makes sense, right? That'll be 40 times by 10,000 shirts in total divided by the number of shirts per run, which is X, and that will give you the number of runs. And yeah, that's it. <laughs> so then C would be equals to, so that would be 400,000 over X plus X to the power 3 over 2. And yep, that's that's basically it. So after that, just derive set equals to zero solve. Now this one, I think I will. Now this one is an end solve situation, right? This is the tech tech active, um, tech active. If it's a tech active, then if you want to find the minimum, you can just sketch it and find the minimum. Okay, so tech active, you would sketch. And then find minimum point. Okay, so note that. Um, let's see. Okay, so note that I think next week I will go through some question on the tech free paper first. Or uh, actually, no, no, I'll go through the, the tech active one. So make sure you bring a calculator. Okay, I think I'll focus more on the tech active because the, the, the tech free stuff, I, might, I have gone through quite a lot of them already in terms of tech free. Now chapter 19, now in order to save time, put it so in order to save time, um, you guys should go back. This is the last week of a holiday, right? Thursday, you have Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then school starts. But when school starts, it's like for math, you already learn everything. Um, and you go to revision at school, right? Pretty sure. Yeah. Which means that you spend, you can spend whatever math class and you have a school doing more questions. So chapter 19 is the one that I want you guys to try. Okay, and if you run into any question that uh, that you can't do, post that onto Discord, and I'll send back explanations. Because I won't have time to go through everything in chapter nineteen. I'll show, I'll briefly show you, show you guys chapter nineteen and how many questions there are. Right, but that's the, I guess that's the best revision chapter for uh, unit to unit four. Because it's only questions for unit four. It covers almost every single thing in unit four. Okay, so chapter nineteen is the one that you guys need to need to work through. But yeah, so I'll focus more on the tech active because we haven't got much, uh, much time on the tech active in the past few weeks. So I'll get to the tech active first. Okay, um, let's see. We have example 18 and then 19, 20 and 21. They get exp exponentially a little bit harder. So I'll go through one more example. So I'll go to example 18. Okay, I'll go to example 18. This is not too bad. Just 
quite a lot of um, trick in here. But um, I'll go through this one and then we'll take a short break after. Okay? So I will spend, I will leave the last three examples, 19, 20, 21, uh, I'll leave them for the second half. Okay? Uh, I'll make the second half a bit shorter for you guys. So the first half, you got to survive through one more question. The cross section of a drain is to be an isosceles trapezium with three sides of length 2 meters as shown. Find the angle theta that maximizes the cross sectional area and find this maximum area. Maximizes cross sectional area. There's no formula. Um, start to define variables. Let what be what. Let what be what? We've got one variable already. We've got the theta. What other variable we need to form an equation? Uh, the area. Yeah, let the area, right? So let A be the cross-sectional area. Okay, the cross sectional area. So, how do we find a cross sectional area? What do you do with that shape in order to find a cross sectional area? Can she split it so it makes two triangles? Or yes, two triangles? that's right. You make two triangles and. Yeah, rectangle in the middle, not yeah, square. You use mm -hmm. the, your measurements to, follow, to find the, the two sides. Correct. Okay. So how do we find the two sides? How do we find this one and this one? All right. Let's say how do we find the vertical side here? Well, isn't that isn't the square? So they're the same. So it'd be two to go around. Um, two two. You mean this one is two? Yeah. No. Okay. It's not a square. Is a rectangle. How do we find the first question mark? The one I highlighted here. Remember, we want a as a function of theta. It has to do something. It has something to do with theta. Right? How do we find theta? How do we find that side in terms of theta? Now, I'll give you a hint. If you draw this line, that side is the same as this side. How would you find that in terms of theta? Um, two cos theta? Close. You're so close! It's two sine theta. Okay, okay? so let's... Uh, if we let that be x, right, then we get sine of theta would be opposite over um, hypotenuse, right? So then 2 times sine theta would be x. Remember, okay, the trick is, so given the hypotenuse, right, the short side is always, you know, the hypotenuse times by sine or cos of theta. But is it sine or cos? Well, remember, what's the vertical axis in the unit circle? Sine, right? So yeah, so any vertical quantities is normally linked to sine. And the horizontal one is linked to cos, which means this one will be 2, right, 2 sine theta. Now, how do we find this one here then? What do you guys think? 2 cos theta? Yes, it is 2 cos theta. Emily, any question? Mm. You sure? I said you understand or you have no idea how, what question to ask? Oh, I get it. You get it? So how? You get it? 2 cos theta? Why 2 cos theta? Because you use this triangle here. If I were to draw that triangle out by itself, right? So that's x and I'll call that, let's say I'll call that y actually and call that x, okay? So if I draw to, to draw the triangle out, this is y, this is x, right? This is theta and this is 2, okay? So sine of theta is opposite which is y over hypotenuse, which is 2. So then 2 sine theta equals 2y. Similarly, you can prove that 2 cos theta equals 2x. Okay? So the horizontal quantity here, x would be 2 cos theta, and this is the same for both of these. Does it make sense how? 
<laughs> that takes the house checking out mentally. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. Can you do it one more time? Explain it one more time. Yes, I can explain it again. All right. So focus on this triangle here. All right. Do you notice that this is the same as theta? Yeah. No, it's not. No, it's not. You're right. This one is theta. Okay, because the z rule, right? So this one, the z rule of this one, right? Mm -hmm. So that one is theta. So you see that one, let's say we call that x, right? So cos of theta, cos of theta is adjacent, right? Over adjacent over hypotenuse, yeah, right? Okay. Yeah. You get it now? So that's x over 2. So you bring the 2 over, mm -hmm. so 2 cos theta equals x. Yeah? yeah. All right? So 2 cos theta. That's why I had to check, make sure I check in with everyone. Okay? If you check out now, you will lose the rest of this, of this question. So 2 cos theta is there, 2 sin theta is there, and the rest is not too difficult, right? So what's the area? Nominally, it's 2 times triangle, right? So area of the triangle plus the area of the rectangle. So what's the area of the triangle? No, it's easier. It's half times uh, length times height. Uh, half uh, 2 cos theta times 2 sin theta. Yes, half 2 cos theta times 2 sin theta. Yeah? Make sense? And then what's the rectangle? It's 2 times 2 sin theta. Yes, it is 2 times 2 sin theta. Emily, does it make sense? This is the short side of the, uh, of the triangle, and the short and the re uh, rectangle is just this one times by this one, which is two. Oh, whoops! Let me erase that. Does that make sense? Kind of. Kind of. Uh, which part does it make sense? The triangle or the rectangle? The rectangle. The rectangle. Oh, the triangle. The triangle. So, uh, did you get the uh, values of the sides here? Like this is 2 cos theta, this side is 2 cos theta, and this side is 2 sin theta. That all make sense? This is what we were going through earlier. To try to find the length of the uh, triangle. Remember the one that I drew the little triangle here out and then um, show the vertical is 2 sin oh. theta? Yeah? So once you've got those two, it's just half of base times height, right? Yeah, yeah so half base times height. That's base times the height. Yeah, so horizontal times vertical. Okay. Alright, so moving on. So that would be uh, simplifying. 2 times half is gone. So that'll be cos, um, 4. I write sine first. 4 sine theta cos theta plus 4 sine of theta. Okay. Again, maximum area, which means you need to derive it. A dash, A prime equals 2. Um, okay, what, what do I use here? What do I do here? Just derive or do I need to do something special? Uh, product rule. Product rule, yes. Product rule on this thing. All right? Because this is u times by a function of theta, which is v. Okay? So then A dash would be u dash v, so that would be 4 cos theta times v, which is cos theta, and then plus uv dash, so 4 sine theta, times by negative sine theta. And then you derive this thing. 4 sine theta would be uh, just 4 cos theta. All right, make sense? Yeah, so far so good. Then how do we, how do we solve this then? Well, that would be 4 cos squared theta. I'm going through this because the algebra is difficult. Bear with me. Minus 4 sine squared theta. Theta. You guys have seen that notation, right? Cos squared sine squared, yeah? And then plus 4 cos theta. How do we solve this? If you set this to equal to 0, how do you solve this? You just take out a common factor. Um, which is? Uh, oh, actually, no, everything doesn't matter. You, you do take out a common factor. There is a common factor you, you can take, take out. Cos theta. Mm, no, because there's no cos theta in here. You can make that into something that has cos theta, but how? You need to remember one thing. Pythagorean. Pythagorean identity. 
What is this? So cos squared theta plus sine squared theta plus one. Yes, that's right. How do we use this? So could you take out the four as a contact and then uh, put the two together? Okay, yes, yes, you take out a car for common factor uh, first. Yep, okay, so minus sine squared theta plus cos theta. And then what's next? Take out minus one. Um, no, I wouldn't do that. So remember, if you want everything to be cos, right? So how do you get rid of sine squared? Remember, when you want to get rid of something, you need to make that as a in terms of the other thing. Can you do that from here? Yeah. Yes, you say sine squared theta equals 1 minus cos squared theta. Make sense? So now these two sine squared theta are linked, which means you can sub it in. So 0 equals to cos squared theta minus, be very careful, you minus a bunch of things. So you put them in brackets 1 minus cos squared theta, and then you plus cos theta. Right? Make sense? Now then you open the brackets. I'm slowly working through the algebra because this is quite tricky. Minus 1 plus cos squared theta it plus cos theta, right? Combine like terms. 2 cos squared theta, and then I rearrange it, plus cos theta minus 1. How do we solve this? Yeah, how do we solve this? Hint is unit one. Is unit one. Can we just rearrange? No. Second hint is quadratics. Do you see it? Uh, um, yeah, that's cos theta equals a or something. Yes, that cos theta equals a. That one turn into. 2a squared plus a minus 1. It's a quadratic. So you can do your ACB table. All right, AC is negative 1 times 2 is negative 2. B is 1. So factors of negative 2 add up to positive 1. It will be 2 and negative 1, right? Yeah, they add up to positive 1. And they multiply to negative 2. But this is a non-modic quadratic, which means you have to factorize out the one in the middle. So plus 2a minus a minus 1, and then you take out common factors. See, this is unit 1, it comes back up again now. And then minus 1 times a plus 1, right? So then you take out a plus 1 as a common factor, and then you get 2a minus 1. Which means that a equals negative 1, or uh, 2a equals to 1. So then a would be 1 half, okay? So a equals to negative 1, or a equals to 1 half. Now, What's a? Well, it's cos of theta equals minus 1 or cos theta equals to 1 half. Which value can we can we take? What angle will get cos equals negative 1? Pi. Pi, right? That's the only answer, all right? How about this one here? What angle will give cos equals to 1 half? Not quite. That's root 2. Oh, it's uh, pi on, let's say 6, or 3, sorry, 3. Sorry, what was it? Pi, pi, on, pi, three. pi on 3, yes, is this angle here. Does it make sense? Yeah, because cos of that is adjacent over hypotenuse, which is 1 half, so then theta must be pi on 3, or you know, 60 degrees. All right? Can it be pi? Remember the angle that we're talking about? Is the angle made between the line and the horizontal? Can it be pi? No, no right? it can't be 180, there's no shape. So this one is rejected. All right, therefore, pi must be, uh, sorry, theta must be pi on three for it to be a maximum uh, cross-sectional area. And then just sub it in, all right? So max area. And remember this, um, this one, normally you have to do second derivative, but if you have no time for it in the exam, just assume it's maximum area. Okay? Assume it's maximum, and just move on. If you have time, second derivative, test it. If you see it's too difficult, can't be bothered. Just don't do it. You may lose one mark. If they're linear, you lose nothing. 
Okay. Um, in this case, I don't think you lose anything. Okay. In this case, you actually, uh, you know, I will assume that they probably won't, won't deduct any mark from you. So area is four sine theta cos theta plus four sine theta. So that would be maximum area would be four sine pi over three cos pi over three, and then I think was it minus. Oh, plus 4 sine pi on 3. All right, just use the formula. So 4 sine pi on 3 is opposite over hypotenuse. Cos of that would be 1 half plus 4 times sine of that would be root 3 over 2. Okay, so that'll be bottom would be 4. Uh, cancel that out, that'll be root 3 plus uh, 2 square root 3. So that answer would be 3 square root 3 meter square. That's a maximum cross section on area. Okay, that make sense? Yeah? That make sense? So, anyway, what is your confidence that you can get this question done right? So, that's the entire question, right? So, that there is actually the entire question. Actually, over is about a bit over a page. Eight. Eight? Okay, a bit more confident. Um, Emily? Mm -hmm. Maybe at four, because I'm not really good at... Trigonometry? Yeah. Yeah, that means you need to go back and practice more questions. When you see sine and cos, you know, get to those ones. So how? Six, seven. Six, seven? Mm -hmm. Sine and cos. So I, I think, I'm pretty sure for you two, sine and cos would be a challenge. Okay? So yeah, that's it. Example 18. And let's take a short break, and then we'll move on to 19, 20, and 21 after the break. Yeah, take a short brain break.